So is everybody ready to go? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. If, um, there's an old story about, uh, a well-worn old story actually, but I'll tell it anyway, about a teacher who's standing in front of her class, um, giving her lesson, and she notices that there's a little boy uh, who's pulling faces at one of the other children. And so she says, as we were all told when we were kids, in England anyway, she says, uh, stop that, Jimmy. Stop that pulling, pulling faces like that, because if you carry on pulling faces like that and the wind changes, you, your face will freeze and you'll look like that forever. And the little boy, Jimmy, turns to her and he says, well, miss, you can't say that you were never warned. <laughs> and in just the same way, ladies and gentlemen, you can't say you were never warned about this debate. Uh, because in the program, it says with such a controversial subject and refreshments in the room, this year's debate promises to be as explosive as ever. And uh, I think it probably will. And the motion for debate today is, as you can see, as the internet and social media are profoundly affecting both thinking and learning in ways that are not always beneficial, education institutions should take steps to encourage learners to reduce their reliance on them. And um, we've got two sets of speakers on either side. One, one uh, group of speakers are going to argue for the motion. The other side are going to argue against the motion. So this is going to be a parliamentary style debate. Uh, they're going to each put their case to you. Each speaker is going to have 10 minutes. And then we're going to throw the discussion open to, to you and ask you for your questions and contributions. And I hope you will get stuck in, as we say, and in the, in the traditional manner, and uh, be as lively and uh, provocative and informative as you always are in these, in these debates. Uh, and once we've had your contributions, then I'm going to ask one speaker from each side to sum up their arguments, and then we will put this to uh, a vote. And we'll do that by a show of hands. And uh, if it's very close, we'll have to think of some other way of counting the votes. But uh, we'll do it with a show of hands to start with. And I should say that um, we always give a disclaimer in, on these occasions. And I should do that again, that um, all of the speakers may not necessarily believe every word they say. Um, <laughs> I have to say that. I think on this occasion, actually, they all do believe every word they have to say, but I say that anyway. And with that one proviso, I'm going to now call on our first speaker uh, to propose the motion. And our first speaker is Joe Edelman of NXHX and Livable Media USA. And he's a social scientist um, and uh, particularly interested in games, participatory performances, and software. And he designs games and group activities, creates, pro, uh, creates performances, and publishes code. I think that's a, a, a rough summary, but you can say more. I will. Joe, over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Am I mic'd? I am mic'd, beautiful. Um, I'll add one thing to that intro, which is that I was CTO of Couchsurfing, um, so I've been interested since then in uh, community and social media and where they work together and where they don't work together. Um, actually, before I begin, I want to, uh, I want to, I want to take a poll. So uh, how many people here are affiliated with some kind of uh, educational institution, higher ed, K through 12 or something? Oh, that's great. Okay, so I'll be speaking to all of you. You're kind of my audience. <coughs> How many people work for an educational technology company? Um, okay, you guys are kind of my enemies, so <laughs> I'll probably offend you, but I'm, I'm glad that it's such a small group because, you know, it's, it's a numbers game, right? Like, <laughs> so um, the motion here, it's about, um, it's about social media at uh, educational institutions. Uh, 
And so I think what, the, fir, the, the place to start is, uh, is that what is the value of educational institutions and does social media serve that value? And uh, just as a kind of shorthand, I'll say the value is, is this. It's a kind of community, a kind of usually in-person community, and a kind of critical inquiry or you know, exploration of knowledge or, or, or what have you. Um, and so the question is, uh, does our, our, the social media or can social media help with this thing, these things or, or does, it, does it hurt these things? And it's interesting, uh, it's, a, it's a very relevant question. It's not just relevant to universities. Um, uh, it seems relevant, for instance, to democracy because uh, critical inquiry and the truth and so on is part of democracy. And we have some big questions about whether social media is really helping with that right now. Um, and also, we have big questions about community. Uh, in the US and also in Britain, there's uh, uh, been a huge spike in teen suicides um, that many connect to social media or to like a different kind of community that's happening in social media versus in-person media and so on. So, so these questions go way beyond uh, classrooms. And uh, I'm really excited about these questions and, and it's specifically excited about the university or the educational institution context because it's conceivable, it's possible that a university or some kind of innovative educational institution could solve this problem for all of us. And what I mean by that is that such an institution could in their kind of like research or innovation come up with a way of doing social media on campus that then is actually the way that actually really helps with community and helps with critical inquiry, right? Like if, if they find a better social media and you test it in a university and it really works and it helps people, you know, pursue the truth, it helps them debate, it helps them connect in person, that could be revolutionary and fix uh, all sorts of larger social problems. So I'm gonna spend most of the rest of my time talking about how how that could possibly happen. Like how could we end up with a university uh, solving this problem of what kind of social media, what different kind of social media is good for, for, for community and, and for critical inquiry. Um, and to do that, I'll give three examples, uh, two of them about universities that I think are doing this well. Um, one that's a, from a research lab uh, but before I do, I want to say where I don't think we will get the solution from. And uh, two places I don't think we'll get the solution from are the big companies, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. Um, I don't think their incentives or their, uh, the pressures that are on them are right for them to invent the kind of social media that's good for community uh, or good for critical inquiry. Um, obviously, Facebook is working on fake news and other similar kinds of issues. Um, but they're working to solve a kind of press release, a, a, a kind of public relations fire. They're not working to invent the social media that's ideal for critical inquiry. This is a kind of a problem that Facebook is not in a great place to, to face. Um, and I also don't think that educational technology purveyors are going to be the ones that give us the solution to social media that's good for community and that's good for uh, critical inquiry because also they don't have the right kinds of pressures. They're worried about making sales, worried about um, pleasing administrators and pleasing professors that are already teaching courses that run on their platforms and so on. They're not thinking about this kind of uh, future that we all need. So where will we get it? Um, this is, uh, so this is the first of three examples. So this is uh, a project uh, from USC, which is the leading film school in the US. It's George Lucas's film school. Uh, it's the film school with the highest budget. And um, they have made their own social media, uh, which is a kind of game system by which um, players use these cards. They're on the right. So, so the entire freshman class at this uh, film school has these cards, and each card uh, is a, a kind of a constraint for a creative project. So the, the, the card may uh, say that you have to make a sci-fi movie, or that your movie should have a certain kind of topic, or a certain kind of event should happen in your movie, or whatever. So they all have these little cards, and they trade them, and then they make film projects undercover, not associated with any class, 
and then the, um, the, the, the uh, film projects are, are scored, they're uploaded and scored by their classmates. And, um, and this has actually replaced the curriculum for most of the year uh, because the students are so motivated to make all these film projects that they, they, they use this. And this is a mix of, um, of online and offline media that make this possible. So I, obviously this is just like a film school example, but it's, a, it's an example of the kind of innovation that I think universities are in a perfect position to do. Um, here's another example. Uh, so this is from a research lab. Um, it's a research lab in, in, in California, and uh, if any of you can visit this place, it's called Dynamic Land, and it's almost like a museum of an alternate technological future. So the way this place works is that there's projectors and cameras all over the place, and there, there's no screens, and you just have pieces of paper, and you can sit down together as a group, or oh, there's also whiteboards, and you can draw things, and the projectors add information to what you draw. So you could work together on a film, for instance, but by cutting and, and rearranging pieces of paper on a table with your friends. And you can work together on a, uh, editing sound, that kind of thing. Um, or, or this is, I think, they're working on a robot here. Um, so oh, the attempt here at Dynamic Land is to make it so that it's easier to work together in person than to do this kind of fake collaboration, which is the mainstream, the Google Docs kind of collaboration, where each of us has our own screens. Um, and we're collaborating, but we're actually uh, looking at the screen and not looking at each other and not having conversations over shared work and so on and so forth. So this is not at a university, but I think it's a good, great example of the kind of innovation that a university uh, or an educational institution uh, could play with. And their software is open source. Um, I mean, obviously, you'd need to have a budget to try to bring this to, to your institution or something, but uh, it's very possible. Um, OK, and my last example. So I, so I think um, research labs like the, like, or other schools are two places you can, you can get this kind of innovation from. My last example is uh, uh, about a school that's getting it from the students themselves. So. Um, this is from a syllabus in a course at RISD, which is kind of the top design school in the US. And they have a course called Computer Utopias. And what they do is they study beautiful visions of technology and people, and how technology and people can get along in different ways. And they study manifestos written by different social scientists about um, technology, and they study science fiction and other kinds of um, people talking about alternate uh, human technological ways of coexisting in the first part of the class. And in the second part of the class, uh, the students build their own social media. Um, and they build their own apps based on these utopias or whatever appeals to them. And I think this is another way to do it. Um, so here's another part of the syllabus. So to, to, to kind of sum up, I think it would be uh, very wrong uh, if, if a university is in a position where it can innovate or a, a maybe also like an alternative high school or a, um, you know, if, if, if it feels like there's a position in which you can uh, try some of this stuff, try a different kind of social media environment that might solve these problems about community and, and critical inquiry. Um, if you're in such a position, it's wrong to go with Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter. Um, let the kids invent their own media. Pull out the best you can find from other universities, from research labs. Um, not just for your own institution, but because it's, uh, it's what we need. This kind of innovation to save democracy and community life, the lives of teenagers, and so on. Thanks. Thank you for that, Joe. Um, can everybody hear all right, by the way? It's difficult to tell up here whether the, whether the acoustics are OK, but um, everything's all right. Good. Well, thank you for that, Joe. And our next speaker is Mark Prensky, who's <laughs> going to speak against the motion. Mark is the coiner of the term digital native. And uh, he's an internationally acclaimed speaker, author, consultant, and practical visionary 
who promotes civilization level change in global education. He's currently the founder and executive director of the Global Future Education Foundation and Institute. Mark, you've got 10 minutes. Thank you. Hello, everybody. The, uh, I'm very glad to be here. I have a, a distinguished set of, of colleagues that we're talking about. I want to ask you the same kinds of questions. We're talking about whether in educational institutions should step, take steps to encourage learners to do one thing or another thing, in this case, reduce their reliance. How many of you are currently students at an educational institution? Okay. Some, but a very small number, I would say under 10. Okay. How many, who in the room is under the age of 20? I would say that number is zero. <laughs> so here we are at every conference I go to on education, which is where there's no kids, there's no students. We're looking out at, I'm looking at, you know, white hair, no hair, whatever. <laughs> um, so let's call up my slides, because this is really important if we can, if, if, it's, if they can bring up my slides here. Um, I spend a lot of time with young people at the elementary, mostly at the high school, often at the high school, college level. Um, we're having trouble, <laughs> oh, let's see if they do it. So, and what I find, and what they tell me, not even just what I find, what they tell me is our kids, and I, when I say kids, I'm talking all the way through university, are disrespected, they're underappreciated, and they're underestimated. So we think we know what's better for them. We, don't ask, we disrespect them by not asking. We don't appreciate what they can do and we underestimate what they actually can do. And that's really a big, that, I think that represents the sense of this motion, which is why I oppose it. We too often treat our kids, let me use a metaphor here, as if they were pets. Our kids are our pets. Hey, what do we say to them? Go here. Whoops, where do I? Sit. Do this. Follow me. Perform the tricks that I taught you. That's called testing. <laughs> Go to the bathroom when I tell you. Now, not then. Oh, okay. So that's really a tough thing. And the kids feel it incredibly when the adult generation, which is a very different generation, I call it the last pre-internet generation, because that's when we grew up, tells them what to do. And it feels like this. I'll leave you with this image. This is, a, this is what we lay on them. We lay a lot of things on them. They should do this. They should be healthier. They should do less of this. They should do more of this. And we don't let them figure it out for themselves. So my, I have three quick points. The first one, somebody said this to me a long time ago, is live in your own times. Use the tools of your times. So you see what the motion is. The last house believes the internet and social media are profoundly affecting both thinking and learning in ways that are not always beneficial, so therefore. But the internet and social media are really the modern ways of communication and conversation. So suppose we just put that into the form and we said this house believes the internet and, uh, this house believes communication and conversation are profoundly affecting both thinking and learning in ways that are not always beneficial. I think I would agree with that. Therefore, educational institutions should take steps to encourage students to reduce their reliance on communication and conversation using modern means. No, I, you could disagree or, or agree with that. I would certainly disagree with it. And even if you argue and take the McLuhanistic prison, you know, position that the medium is the message, well, I think we have better media. We can do much, much more with the internet. We can do much, much more with social media in terms of modes of communication, in terms of ways than we ever had before. We have so many more affordances. If only, you know, this is what my opponent just said. If, yeah, it wouldn't be so bad if only we built the right stuff. We built the right stuff. 
And that's really the, the second point, which is, where's number two here? <laughs> ways that are not beneficial. Who decides which ways are beneficial? This implies that we, or educational institutions, decide for them what's beneficial. And that we can actually tell at this point what's beneficial in the context that they'll be living in 10, 20, 50 years from now. And I don't think we can do that. I think it's really beneficial to the generation that's doing the teaching, to our generation. I think what we're saying is in ways that are not always beneficial to us, because we like face-to-face. -face. They might not like it as much. That doesn't benefit us. So the real issue is who does it benefit? And when we hear words like overload, for example, and I've never heard a young person say information overload. I hear it all the time from people my age or people of my generation, because we grew up pre-internet. We didn't have that much information. Suddenly, we got a lot of information. So we're overloaded, no question. Young people are not overloaded. They grew up handling this stuff. That doesn't mean they're not stressed. But where are they stressed? They're stressed by rankings. They're stressed by getting into college and university. They're stressed by the things we make them do, not by the amount of information in their lives. Their social health, I think, is just fine. Our social health may have issues that we have to work on because we're in this terrible generation that's in between two worlds. And so I see some issues there, but you know, it, we're not looking for the dry land. And that was, a, that was a term that was in your book. We said, we, oh God, we need to learn to swim and we want to find dry land. They will find their own dry land. That's what they're doing. And so the third point here is are we losing benefits? Are we losing something? And the answer is quite possibly yes. We have lost lots of things as our lives and technology has changed. I used to love, you know, sailing ships and clipper ships. And now the only place you can see them is in pictures or occasionally in a movie. You know, there are things that, that people love. Paper books will be another example that will eventually, I once saw a painting in a hotel of a shelf of paper books. And that's what's gonna happen. They'll all just be pictures on shelves because things are moving in another direction. But we're so early. We're so early. Education is a great experiment in this age. The difference, the reason digital natives and digital immigrants still persists, and in my Google searches, I see it every day, is because it's a cultural difference. It's not a technological difference, it's a cultural difference. Look at all the things that are changing. Look at how the, the women who told the truth made the cover of the year on Time Magazine. Look at how those attitudes are changing, or sexuals, or LBGT, or any of these things, or same-sex marriage. The whole world is changing its attitudes. It doesn't mean that people are intrinsically different, but it means that they are very, very behaviorally and culturally different. And so the people who love talking face to face in our generation, that may disappear. That may not be something that's as, as important. It may be important in some cases, but these kids are afforded so many more things that they can do. And what we're learning let me close with this, is we are just learning to be nodes on a network. So when Facebook reaches billions of people, and whatever it's up to now, two billion or more, that means that each of us is a node on that network. And we have to learn what to do. First thing we did was, okay, let's share pictures of our families or our friends. Let's do this. Let's make a lot of friends. Let's do this. We don't know. We're learning, we're figuring this out. But if we think that the adult generation is going to be able to figure this out for the young people, I would totally disagree. So therefore, I don't think that educational institutions should do anything beside listen to the young people and guide the young people as they make their own decisions and as they move into this new digital future, which is theirs. Thank you.
Thank you for that, Mark, and thank you, thank you for t keeping to time, um, which both our opening two speakers have done. And I've noticed, by the way, which nobody told me about before, but there is an interesting little bit of new technology which appears on the front of the screens here, which is uh, a clock that counts down. So if any of our remaining two speakers want to know how much longer they've got left, then just have a look at the, speech, at the screen. Our next speaker is Julia Hobsbawm. And Julia founded the Knowledge Networking Business and consults, writes, teaches, talks, and blogs on a number of topics, including um, the one that she has defined on modern knowledge networking social health. She's the first, the world's first professor of networking, and she was made honorary visiting professor by London's Cass Business School and at the University of Suffolk. Uh, and she's the author of a new book, Fully Connected, which I think is, is available here, and she'll no doubt provide details about that. And she's also written and presented the five-part BBC Radio 4 series, Networking Nation. Julia. Thank you. Oh, I love that. Listen to the children, they're always right. When my 12-year-old says, I'm not tired, and he hears the ping of his, uh, his uh, smartphone, I should just let him get on with it, Mark. I should let him dictate the terms. Um, some of you may have noticed that my pen ran out at the beginning. And I tried to make notes on my iPhone and thought, that's a mistake. And so I needed a pen. I thought, is that a metaphor for this session? You know, is the pen still mightier than the internet sword? Um, and of course, I believe ultimately that it is. Can I just ask, apropos the motion about reducing reliance, a motion in which, of which I'm in favor, could you put your hand up if you've ever attempted to reduce your reliance on, let's say, sugar or alcohol, but some kind of food? Have you ever consciously attempted to reduce your reliance on something because it was bad for your health? Oh, really? Interesting. OK, good to know. So. Me too. So I'm in favor of the motion that we reduce our reliance. I don't think we should stop it. I think we should reduce our reliance. So I'm going to open with an image. I'm clicking. You see, it's why I hate technology. You see, that's the thing. I rest my case. My slides don't work. OK, two bowls of chips. And neither of them are brilliantly healthy. They are ubiquitous, they are hard to resist, but you know, have too much of them and you know what happens. And the more chips you eat, they're a bit more-ish. Some of you will be ahead of me on the joke, which is the chips formed something called Moore's Law. And Moore's law said that computing technology would double every two years. And last year, because we've all accelerated the world of the triple revolution of internet, social, and mobile, Moore's law ran out. So I just want us to be under no illusion that we are in a revolutionary, scary, tipping point time. So it's impossible to have a sort of slightly relaxed, yeah, but, no, but argument about the internet and computer technology. We have to understand it could make us infobese. It already is making us infobese. We cannot just say, oh, let's all be libertarian, have as much of it as you like. No. And education and modern connectedness are pretty much as old as each other. This is Thomas Alva Edison, and this is an image of the laying of the underground cables in about 1857. So give or take, we're in the sort of ballpark of about 150 years ago. And as Mark said, on the opposite side of this particular fence, um, you know, it's recent. So there's lots of room for change. There's lots of room for improvement. And by the way, lots of the internet and technology and social media and digital learning is for the good. But this motion 
that I'm very passionate that you vote in favor of is to reduce the reliance on it. Not to have either or, not to have an Orwellian two legs good, four legs bad. Because of course, we, of course we're in the age of overload. I mean, 6,000 tweets posted a second. It was only in 2015 that Mark Zuckerberg posted on Facebook that there were a billion people on the network on a single day in August. And he said, and I quote, it's just the beginning of connecting the whole world. And I thought, that doesn't feel great. That feels a bit weird. And it's now two billion. We are living in an era of cognitive dissonance where the human who has not changed our body clock, we've not changed the hours available to us in the week, we've not changed our fundamental physiology or our fundamental psychology, is operating cheek by jowl with de facto a new species entirely called technology. And if anyone thinks that doesn't bring ill effects that need with maturity and hindsight some kind of corrective, they need their head examined. Because there is a hierarchy of communication. Broadcast medium, mass medium, speed medium. You know, Donald Trump will go down as the president of Twitter. That will be his legacy, all right? He uses a broadcast medium. You tweet in a nanosecond. The verification of, you know, whether it was a far-right movement or whether it was a friend, who cares? A detail. Social media and broadcast media is built for that. Intimacy. Why you're bothering to be here in a room. Diplomats call being in a room, smelling the room. You are using your senses. That is at a premium. And the idea that those of us in healthy, developed economies, those of us enjoying health, I mean, that wonderful app, No Isolation, that wonderful little mini robot, I had them speak at my conference. They are for kids that are sick. Of course you want distance learning for kids that are sick. Of course you want tablets in Africa when there are no roads to a major city. I'm not talking about that kind of electronic education, but those of us in advanced Western democracies with classrooms with, I mean, hello, why would we not have face-to-face -face in the room as the default? Everything else is not the same. So an interesting thing happened when the internet came in. It's also recent. A whole spontaneous range of academic papers began to look at the organizational formation of the jazz ensemble versus the orchestra. And what they seem to conclude is that organizations that move fluidly and flexibly and dynamically, where there's both the soloist role and the group role, are more resilient. They're more able to adapt. So again, by all means, have your downloadable PDF, your blah, all that. But the idea that you stay rigid and that technology is the new rigidity with which you teach and with which kids learn, I do not buy that. And why are we all learning anyway? To be like Magritte, to enter the surreal world of work. Okay? You learn to earn, broadly speaking. This is not a moment to have a row about the ethics and morality of learning for its own sake, blah, blah, blah. But you ask any university governing body anywhere in the world what the primary measurable output is of the education, and they say graduates have earned and uh, earned big within three years of leaving the academic institution. So it's about work. It's about making them fit to work. And what does the world of work say? We need skills that are about human-to-human -human interaction, social skills, critical thinking skills. These are not screen-learnt skills. The amount of time spent on screens is not commensurate with a productive economy. It is not commensurate with a creative economy. It is not commensurate with a confident teenage group, the group so beloved of Mark, the group who knows best. No. They're stressed, just like we are. Briefly, Muhammad Yunus, 
who uh, has brought 95 million women out of poverty in Bangladesh by inventing microfinancing and learning. He didn't use a computer, he just went and lent them money. Change, radicalism, vision does not come from technology sold down the line by Silicon Valley. Sorry about that, it's just a fact. So we just need to get real here. We need to not drink too much techno Kool-Aid. Here's a picture of me at the gym, joking. <laughs> so let's just talk briefly about health. Health is embedded in the definition of the World Health Organization, 70 years old. This hasn't changed. And social is embedded in it. But there is no social literacy. There is no social practice. Social, 70 years ago, meant class. It meant how, how much nutrients you had that made you fit to fight for your country, literally. So social connected health and well-being is a whole conversation we need to have. And it can't be answered in this context or any other context by going, oh yeah, let it roll, bring it on. No, it's got to be like a little bit monitored, a little bit measured. I believe that there's such a thing as the, uh, the knot of social health, knowledge, networks, and time being harnessed. The real finite resources of the human, not the infinite, limitless computer capacity that uh, funds and generates the growth that the uh, educational establishment might want. It's how humans learn in a finite way. Knowledge dashboards, the five-a-day food campaign, was very famous. It was totally made up, totally unscientific, but it stuck. And we need to have a literacy about what the components of learning are, irrespective of the mediums on which they're learnt. And a large component of that is face-to-face, -face. a large component of that is online, a large component of that is community. And all the psychology, all the sociology, more or less echoes this point. So to fly in the face of that with this vote, I believe would be a serious mistake. And I'm going to end with an image I will never be forgiven for showing, but he doesn't know it's being shown because he's in London. This is our 19-year-old son, Roman, here in Berlin two months ago. He's looking like all 19-year-olds, tense, shoulders up, not happy, but he came to the conference, he worked the room, he worked the reception, he learned, he listened, he took part. That is the education that we want to be giving our children. The classroom education, this guy's on the internet like everybody else five hours a day, but something surrounded by a parental force, a force of experience, a force of guidance. If you believe this side, we need to do away with all of that and let the marvelous gold rush of infobesity give us all, you know, pleasure, limitless, uh, Moorishness. And I believe that would be a mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Well, our final panel speaker is Claire Fox, who's going to speak um, against the motion. And Claire is the director of the Institute of Ideas, which she established to create a public space where ideas can be contested without constraint. She convenes the yearly Battle of Ideas Festival, and she's also a panelist on BBC Radio 4's The Moral Maze. And she's a, a columnist for the Times Educational Supplement and for the Municipal Journal. She's also the author of a recent book on free speech called I Find That Offensive. Claire. Thank you. Um, maybe because I've come from Britain, I want to start by talking about the British royal family. Uh, the Duke of Cambridge, uh, Prince Edward, gave a major speech at the Children's Media Summit yesterday in Manchester. And it was quite a political speech, which is unusual for the royal family. And at that speech, the uh, Duke of Cambridge expressed alarm at the impact of social media on young children and their mental well-being. The future king of, uh, of England, uh, the father of George, age four, and Charlotte, two, uh, made a hard-hitting speech, which was depressingly negative and seemed pertinent to today's motion. 
in which he talked about how parents and teachers can keep children off social media. And the quote he made, uh, one of the quotes he gave was he said, how do we convince our children to go outside and be active and fit when all they want to do is to play online? I thought that that was an ironic question because one of the reasons why children don't go outside and play is because we adults responded to an earlier moral panic about children's welfare, particularly around their safety, around child abuse and so on, by overreacting, overregulating, and overprotecting the young. Educational institutions and parents became so obsessed with keeping children secure that many young people have been denied the resilience building freedoms that past generations enjoyed. We've gone to ludicrous lengths to over-police playgrounds, for example, or to over-police and regulate games to eliminate risk. The roaming distance, that is how far children play from their home, has decreased 90% in 30 years. We've allowed adult paranoia to create a climate of fear that scared children away from free play outside and offline. So I believe that the last thing that we should do is to launch another moral panic about safety online and the dangers to learning and young minds of social media. We've already reared cotton wool kids who grow up to become generation snowflake, snowflake uh, and go to university cowed and retreating into their safe spaces. And now we're in danger of creating digital e-snowflakes scared of the web too. The Duke of Cambridge also asks, how do we protect family time, he says, and teach our kids about actual connections when all their communication is through their phone? And this, of course, is backed up by educationalists, uh, the people I know who work in education, who worry that far too much time is spent on social media, not reading books, etc. Um, but let's have a sense of perspective here. Educational institutions are sadly at the forefront, I think, of a moral panic. I think we should remind ourselves that fears of people being overwhelmed by technological advance are not new. In ancient Greece, Socrates conceived that writing would, quote, create forgetfulness in the learners' souls uh, because they will not use their memories. And Socrates advised parents uh, only to allow children to hear wholesome allegories and not improper tales, lest their development went astray. Interesting to remember that in the 18th century, there was a widespread panic about the novel corrupting young women by romantic fantasies. These days, we'd be delighted if young women were reading novels, uh, never mind being corrupted by them. Um, or there was, of course, widespread concern about the arrival of the radio, that it would distract children from reading and diminish school performance. But there is a key difference with this particular panic about social media today because we don't focus on the alleged moral threat about what new technology poses to children, but rather we emphasize the risks reconceptualized through the language of medical and psychological uh, uh, language. We're now told that the internet is the latest threat to young people's mental health. For example, a new report out in the UK called States, Status of Mind by the Education Policy Institute uh, it pointed out that, or argued that the, uh, youth between the ages of 14 to 24, uh, when asked about their opinions on social media platforms, uh, the vast majority said that their mental health was being severely affected by their reliance and things that were happening on social media. We were also told that smartphones are as addictive as cigarettes, alcohol, and crack cocaine. But a systematic literature review of the evidence, particularly uh, that done recently by mental health researchers at King's College London, were rather sceptical about this, uh, whether there was a clear link between cause and effect. Because even though there is a small uh, 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 um, uh, 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 relationship between online use and depression, it's rather insignificant. But the weakness of the reviewed studies is that it relied on young participants self-reporting uh, rather than being diagnosed with depression. And these days, many young people use the language of mental health promiscuously, largely because I think they've internalized adult preoccupation and they use diagnostic and therapeutic lingo with ease. Children as young as five or six, when they're surveyed, say that they're suffering anxiety, panic attacks, 
post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. They haven't picked that up from the playground. They've learned that from us um, who have a tendency to medicalize uh, 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 social problems. I think then there's a danger of pathologizing the dangers of the internet um, as a threat to mental health. And I think that actually exacerbates a trend already existing, which is it encourages the young to see life's challenges and the vicissitudes of life and growing pains of adolescence all through the prism of mental health. Teaching children that using Facebook or being upset by name calling on Twitter is a diagnosable condition is likely to make them even more anxious. One question we might want to ask is, what do we want children to think about and learn uh, that's so challenged? Do we want them to learn and think that surveillance is a good thing? Because I think a lot of the attitudes to technology, greater blocking, monitoring, tracking, all in the name of protecting children, uh, the expansion of content filtering technology in schools and homes, I think teaches a dangerous message. It teaches them that they, it's okay to be spied on all the time. There's an interesting report by Sandra Leighton Gray, the Institute of Education, and Andy Philpin, a professor of children and technology, called Invisibly Blighted, the Digital Erosion of Childhood, that says there is a serious risk that the next generation develop in a way that makes them think that they have no right to privacy. Institu educational institutions are in a particular panic at the moment about sexting, uh, and they are worried uh, uh, how this is affecting young people's mental health again. But actually, uh, that report shows, says that young people express a sense of collective outrage about the intrusion of figures of authority in their lives. And I think that is a healthy pushing back. They believe they have a right to keep their online chats, their text messages, their tweets, their Facebook conversations private. And they resent when teachers have greater rights to police and search their phones and pry and, di and dip into their lives, even than the police do. They report that it's a bit creepy, like stalking, obsessive when adults are constantly saying, are you on your phone too much? What are you saying? And so on and so forth, that it lacks respect. Young people's surveys actually indicate a positive desire to be in control of their use of social media. And many are aware of the pitfalls. And they want to see through design and not feel tricked by scams or hidden agendas. They understand about commercial nature of online environment. They want to be able to manage their own digital uh, uh, footprint and so on. They're even developing their own moral codes around sexting in terms of when it's appropriate, when it's not, if it's one-to-one, -one, whether it's a breach of confidence and so on. They're well aware of the risks of cyberbullying uh, bullying, uh, and even how much time they spend on the web. So I think that we're in danger of over-panicking. One worry I do have, and I concede, is that social media reinforces notions of echo chambers. And I do think that society is blighted at the moment uh, by a kind of tribal attitude, particularly to politics. Of course, I have to mention Brexit, but anyway, um, I'm going to mention it because one of the ways it expresses itself in Britain is the number of people, actually many who work in education, who say, I've never met a Brexit voter. Has anyone ever met a Brexit voter? Which obviously means that they should get out more because there are quite a lot of them, more of them, in fact, than anyone else. Um, but that's because they're in their echo chamber. Um, I want the young to be open to a wide range of opinions and experiences, and I don't want them to be overprotected in a bubble. And I think it's a problem that Twitter and Facebook does create kind of confirmation bias um, and, and so on. However, I don't think that can be countered by turning the internet into a safe space. Those safe spaces and protected spaces now so familiar on university campuses, particularly in the UK and the US, um, where ideas and speakers who put forward views different to one's own are or, or are challenging or controversial are banned and censored. Ironically, the internet and social media could be an antidote to such anodyne refuges of the like-minded, an antidote to echo chambers, not the cause of them. Because actually, the internet encourages discovery. You can discover things about new books, new bands, new ideas, meet new people. Social media is called social for a reason, because it's actually a virtual town hall. It need not be isolating and fragmenting. It's a treasure trove of information, relationships, creative opportunities. And so I think it's, I know, however, that it's a risk. I know that if we let the young go on the uh, social media on, uh, um, without a chaperone, they might come across jihadi videos, pornography, and so on. 
But that's life, and life's an adventure full of risks. Otherwise, it's not worth living. So my fear is not that children are addicted or too reliant on social media, that we, the adults, are creating a culture of fear that's keeping them stultified, infantilized, and never able to stand on their own two feet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Right, well, you've now heard from all our panel speakers, so it's over to you now. I'm going to throw the discussion open to, to the floor. Uh, so if you would like to ask a question or make a contribution, let us have your thoughts or ideas on this, on this subject, please uh, let me know. It's very difficult to see at the back uh, here, so those who are sitting at the back might have to jump up and down or wave their hands a bit harder than people at the front. But who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, just near the door there on the... And please, could you introduce yourself and uh, also wait for the microphone before you start speaking so that we can all hear. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Pratik Ghosh. Uh, I'm a founder of a social media. It was wonderful to listen to all the participants. I'm more on the right side of the uh, guys. And yet, I am a social media creator. I would like to make a comment about how social media can be different. So what I have developed is a social media around storytelling, which is only audio, which, does not, which is not about who you are, but what you are, where anybody can listen to a story which is done by anybody in any language of any genre. So my comment is, what's happening with the social media right now is seeing is becoming believing to an extent where we no longer use our brain to believe. So we again must use our different sensory. I mean, whether we have eyes, but we have ears. So, and we have our own mouth. So I don't think the debate is really about good or bad. There must be a middle way because as a civilization, as a human race, we must move on taking the advantage of what is coming through the technology and yet not forget our own history. So that's my comment. Thank you very much. May I respond briefly? Yes, briefly, and if you, yeah. Um, just uh, that I uh, agree, uh, and that I think that uh, educational institutions are in a special position to adopt uh, alternative forms of media because they're not driven by the same advertising market share concerns. Um, so uh, the, I think the big open question is, is how can um, those responsible for the media environments at educational institutions find out about things like that, things like what I demonstrated? Okay, thanks for that. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, I, I would just say it's really important to recognize how early we are in the process. This was like the first years of cars or the first years of airplanes. And people like you are going to have incredible numbers of ideas, and that's how we're going to adapt and eventually, I think, come to some consensus on what's good and what's not good. But then the technology will advance again, and we're going to have to go through this process over and over again, faster and faster. Uh, welcome to the world. Okay. Thanks for that. Next question. Yeah. Again, over towards the... Yeah, you've got the mic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm a founder of a university that that really relies on student-centered learning, student-driven learning. So this is basically what we're talking about all the time. I think if you would change the wording of this phrase, um, where it says you should take steps to encourage learners to reduce their reliance on social media, to help them, encourage them, and empower them to understand social media. 
then you would put young people in the situation where they can make a decision on their own how to use this tool. Then, because social media, like, um, like the internet and digital technology um, in general, is neither good nor bad. It's a tool, and the question is, do you understand the tool, and do you, how do you decide um, how to use this tool, and for what good, for what reason do you want to use it? So we need to give them everything they need to understand how social media works, why social media provides us with whatever they do, and then by that encourage them to make their own decision and come up with creative ideas how to use all this digital technology. That's our, um, yeah, that's our responsibility, not to um, encourage them to reduce something, but help them understand how these things work. And that's maybe a way to, to bridge the gap between these two parties, I don't know. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, Julia I, just wanted to comment on well, that briefly. I worked for many years in book publishing, and you know, book publishing always used to say one of the reasons why it's so difficult for books to break through is because it would be like launching uh, a thousand different models of toothpaste onto the market every single week. There is too much. And with the greatest of respect, you are a social media advocate because you're a social media producer. And I don't believe that everything needs to be mediated and filtered through a new app or a new platform. I believe we have to innovate the way people learn and the way people teach and the way people connect with the ideas that are fresh and old. And that's the debate I want to have in education, not ultimately markets and marketing. Plus, I would say this motion isn't about social media. It's about internet and social media. So it's also about veracity. It's about research. It's about looking up rather than thinking it through. Social media is one part of the conversation, but it isn't the whole story. And I'm sorry to be pernickety, but I think we should be quite literal about the terms of this question. Okay, thanks for that. Claire, did you want to say something? Yeah, I can't decide whether this is on my side of the motion, but it's an answer to the... I'm not very good on these debate things, right? Um, <laughs> but I'm going to say what I think about what you just asked. Um, I'm, I'm actually not keen on student-centred learning. In fact, I think that's an abdication of responsibility by educators very often. And I do think that there's a, a, a real problem. And the last thing that I want are educators spend their whole time educating young people about the use of the internet and social media. But largely because, as it happens, there is such a thing as a digital native. And generally, they know more about social media than the adults who are educating them. But what they don't know anything about is knowledge, right? They're quite good on their apps. They're quite good on social media, but they've never heard of Socrates or Jane Austen. They are not familiar with psychology. They know nothing of history. So I would prefer that educators would educate young people into the uh, thousands of years of the best that's known and thought and stop panicking about social media. I also think there's a danger that educators that then, in a way, to suck up to the young, say, oh, I'm going to get in with the digital natives by kind of whizzing around with lots of uh, educational technology tools to show them how hip I am. Um, actually, um, and we all know people like that, and it's a lot of smoke and mirrors, but it also can be a distraction from the content of what they're supposed to be teaching. Um, and you can end up in a situation whereby it's all form and no content. But also, um, I think, sort of rather, rather disgracefully in a way, kind of put learners in the driving seat when in fact they are there to learn from somebody who knows more than them. Mm -hmm. So teachers should keep well away from this kind of moralizing how you should use the internet. I think you should cross the floor, Claire, and vote with us. No, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that young people are over-reliant on social media. I do think that educational institutions can be. Okay. Um, and that's a problem. That's not what the motion was. I think young people are actually handling social media fine, but they are not going to be able to handle it if we scare the hell out of them every time they try and use it, which was the point of what I was trying to say. OK, OK, no, no, no. Let's, let's have some more contributions from the audience. I, I'm in the back. Yeah, the, the, the back. lady in the, the... No, you don't need to reinforce it now. You can okay. reinforce it and you're summing up. 
We've got another qu another question there about six rows from the front. Lady. Okay, I, I have to mic, so I'm in the back, nobody sees me, but uh, I'm a little bit irritated about a belief, belief, belief. I heard uh, Julia say, Excuse me. I believe, I believe. Excuse me a minute. No, I said the lady six rows from the front. Oh, so, sorry. It's okay. He's going to be even sorry. more irritated now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Hmm. I'm just, yeah, I have the mic, sorry, I can't. <laughs> I I'm sorry about that, but I can't see you at the back, that's why. That's got, to, got to wait till you're actually called to ask a question. Yeah. Also sorry to take your spot, um, but I, I really want to say this. So one thing I'm finding really interesting is that there's this binary between young people, and I don't see anything in this statement about the only people who aren't beneficially, um, you know, having experiences from social media being young people. I think a lot of older people are using Facebook. In fact, I think my mother's much more active on Facebook than I am. And that's quite true uh, of a lot of people. And as the plenary this morning suggested, learners aren't just young people. We have this second adolescence and everyone's learning the internet. So I'm just curious if you could speak to this idea that this doesn't just have to be a generational divide because I think a lot of my students who I used to teach in their 20s are much more internet savvy than older uh, you know, learners who aren't digital natives, if we're gonna use that term. Okay, thanks for that. If we could go back to the gentleman at the back who yeah, I rudely yeah. interrupted before. S sorry for that, sorry. <laughs> they gave me the mic, so um, I'm uh, all uh, over here in the last row. Off so uh, yeah. I w what I was, uh, wanted to say is, yeah, it's cheap seat, exactly. <laughs> um, I was a little bit irritated about belief, belief, belief. It sounds like religion. I think we should look and see, uh, try out, pilot, uh, test, evaluate, and look to empirical data. What's the validity of, of all those ideas, thoughts, etc.? I think it's too much religion, and we should really proceed with, with empirical data and uh, do more research in this field. Okay, thank you for that. Now, let, uh, we, we're going to have to start winding up soon, so I want to take a few more. The lady here, just about four rows back, yeah. My name is Sean Griffith. I'm from BI, the Norwegian School of Business. I thank you for a very interesting debate. Thank you, Julia, for reminding us about health and what it is to be healthy, what we need. But reading the wording as it is, taking steps to encourage learners to reduce their reliance on anything, I would vote for because I think we need to teach our students to rely on themselves and to look at what wisdom and knowledge they have within themselves and I, I think that if we can reduce their reliance on anything we should do that so I'm certainly voting uh, in favour of this. Okay thank you for that I'm going to take three or four quick contributions then then we'll ask our speakers to sum up. Yeah gentlemen over there towards the side by the door. The Independence in Norwich University, I think as an educational institution, we are already reducing students' reliance on uh, internet and social media because exam is defining the curriculum and typically you are not allowing students to use either the internet or social media in the exam situation. Thank you. Yes, in the, um, there's two on this side. One about four rows back, just on the aisle here. That's it. Thank you. Um, when I see the terms here, the internet and social media, they're so incredibly vague, and there is a spectrum of the internet and of social media. Um, when I think of social media, though, I go back to a cartoon figure, Nick Oteen. Does anyone here remember Nick Oteen? He was yeah. some sort of pusher guy who was promoting cigarettes at the edge of the school. Some of the social media has a very uh, different um, goals that it wants to achieve, more towards Nick Oteen, who's trying to get us addicted and hooked, and other social media may have different aspects like uh, have been described over here. So I think we need to consider what are the, uh, are these innocent, naive, um, beneficial forces that are, um, internet and social media, or are there some of them that have different goals and intentions? And how do we educate uh, all of ourselves how to um, deal with these critically and reflect on them so that we can make our own decisions? Okay, thank you. 
I think there's one behind you, just, by, just towards the camera there. Hi, I'm Mark Williams. Uh, I'm not in education, but I am an employer in a tech company. It's really an observation. Um, when I have a very difficult problem to solve, I ask my older staff, because my younger staff haven't got the concentration span, and we work really hard with our, young, our younger staff with their concentration spans, and it takes about two or three years because, before we can get them to actually give the deep thought. So it's not a comment on social or internet, but it's just a comment on, from my point of view, an observation as to it is an issue for us. Thank you. And one more. Yes, I think there. Hello, my name is Sabina Moops. Um, I don't believe in digital natives. I think they don't exist. I think it was a really good word to get attention at a time when we didn't know what it was. I'm teaching at a university. Um, usually our first year students are 17 or 18 years old. They are not very savvy beyond the two or three applications they use. Um, I think actually we need to train them or give them opportunities to find out more social media and more and better use of the internet, not less. And definitely I would agree with my colleague from Norway, at the same time encourage them to not rely on any of the tools we give them too much, but learn what you just said, rely a bit on their brain and their own thinking and creative skills. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on the questions because I've just been shown the red card like Pogba. Um, so we've, we've got to move on. And I'm going to ask one speaker from either side now just to sum up their arguments. And first of all, the opposition, Mark. Well, you're both going to speak, but I think you're going to go first. No, I, 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 uh, Claire's going to go first. Yeah, and you're I'm going, going to, to split your time. You've got five minutes, so you have two and a half minutes each. Precise. I'm, I'm, I'm wary of anything called awareness raising because it's always about uh, warning of the dangers, particularly in today's climate. So when people say what we've got to do is educate the young about the internet they, or social media, they mean about the dangers of it. That's what they mean, not the, be not the creative potential of it. So I, I, I wouldn't go down that road. Um, I, 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 I think I'll finish with the concentration span point. You know, I, I think that's a myth. Um, the, teen, the significant teenagers in my, li um, in my life spend hours and hours and hours concentrating on certain things, um, largely online, uh, funnily enough. Um, what we've got to do is to make the offline world as exciting and as entrancing as that which they're looking at on the screen. I also work with the BBC, and it's often adult producers who've got such a diminished view of young people, that they think that they have got no attention span, dumb down the programmes that they make in order to attract young people, treat them like idiots, and basically then blame the young for not rising to the challenge. What we as adults ought to do is to produce the very best of everything to inspire the young off and online, stop overprotecting them and stop scaring the hell out of them and actually collaborate with them intergenerationally to make the best out of social media uh, um, and the best out of the internet. We've got loads of political problems to face. This isn't one of them, for God's sake. The world's bad enough, right? Don't let's create even more problems than we need to. Thank you. <laughs> Mark. So the last person I talked to who said, let's reduce our reliance on technology was an air traffic controller. <laughs> the, there's a lot of scare talk going around and, and, and I think we heard it from, we, we heard it from that side and we heard a, an argument against it. And it's really important that we understand that what humans are really good at is adapting. And that we're in a new time and we have this new technology. And one of the things that the young generation is doing is adapting at a very fast and furious pace. And I'm dismayed to hear the kind of comments that I've heard in this room from many people about young people. And if we were half young people, which we should be next time if we possibly could, we would be hearing a very different thing. So I really say that, that we need to have much more respect for our young people. 
I think we need to listen to them a whole lot more. I think they're telling us that and they're crying for that. And the, the kind of judgment that we do, either as teachers who say they don't know anything and they have to know who Socrates was, or do, remember the cartoon of, of um, Socrates contemplating the bust of Homer, and Homer is Homer Simpson. Um, <laughs> you may have seen that. Uh, I, I love the comment about empowering. And I think that that's what's happening to the kids today. They're empowered by all the tools they have. And our job is to empower them further, not to be their parents, to give them guidance, but not to tell them what to do because they're gonna need to figure out what to do. We'll be dead, it's their world. Let's help them make it better. Okay. Thank you for that. Julia, you're going to, you've I got am. five minutes to sum up. I'm going to stand up again, because uh, as this is adversarial, I'm going to pretend I'm in a court of law and I'm summing up, and you are the jury. Uh, very interesting last point about technology and the old air traffic control argument. You know, I want my pilots to be qualified. That's a very good argument that's often wheeled out. This is the 30th anniversary of PowerPoint death by PowerPoint. What's interesting about PowerPoint is that it had an equal and opposite effect. On the one hand, it was a fantastic equalizer. It game changed, as we've all shown, how technology is used in presentations. It meant more junior people could present. But when the Challenger shuttle crashed, they found that NASA had had a presentation on PowerPoint three months before that pointed out on PowerPoint the very technical deficiencies that in the end were not acted on. Why? Because to the previous point, you tune out if it's all screen learnt and you don't absorb it, you don't inhabit it. And therefore, be careful what you wish for with technology running everything. Their argument that they would like you to vote for is pretty much summed up in two ways. Kids know best and there's a moral panic. Our argument believes the neuroscience that's come out most recently from California, from Matthew Lieberman, that says the healthy human brain has one default position only, and it affects and unifies every single person on the planet all the time. And what is that default position? It is a social position, and it is more sp precisely, who do I love and who loves me? How connected am I? And what we absorb and what we learn and how we behave is based on how we feel. And we feel more in the trust and company of people with whom we have physical, not remote proximity. We believe in community. We don't believe in a commerce-driven new form of learning as being as valid as using technology for a community-based idea. And in summation, be careful how many chips you eat and reduce your reliance on sugar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julia, and thank you to all our panel speakers. We're now going to move to the vote. So can I ask all those in favor of the motion which is that as the internet and social media are profoundly affecting both thinking and learning in ways that are not always beneficial, education institutions should take steps to encourage learners to reduce their reliance on them, to raise your right hand, just one hand, not, not both hands, but to raise your right hand. Okay, and all those against? Hmm. I think that's very close. And I, but I would say that is just defeated, but I'd be prepared to do it again. Let, shall, we, shall we run it again? All those, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And all those against? Yeah. I think, I, think that, I think that the motion is defeated, but very narrow, narrowly, only just. I think it was. 
What? <laughs> count off. All right, the motion count is carried. Off. Count off. I told you, I count can't see anything. But unless, like, unless I you want to have a count. You go to one side, you go to the other side? Yes, yes. All right, oh, yes. do that. Sure, yeah, good idea. All right. If you would like, well, if you want to take this very seriously, then everybody in favor of the motion, please go to that side of the room, and everybody against, please go to that. No, yeah, do it. Like, if you oh, agree with us. I'm not going to have a row about which side of the room to go. <laughs> if you agree with us. In favor of the motion oh, yeah. is there. Yeah. In yeah. favor of the motion. Okay, let me yeah. All right, we'll <laughs> If you agree with them, go to that side. Everybody in favor of the motion, please go to that side. Everybody against to, to that us. side. Come on, guys. Come on over to I don't think it's going to make. Right, it's classic. Last minute lobbying. This is awesome. <laughs> no conferring. <laughs> Vote for community over here. Yeah. Community versus commerce. Community over here. <laughs> Bad guys over there. Oh, they're standing up and cheering. If you want to let Silicon Valley run the world, go to the other side. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I think they've decided by now. Rally the troops. Rally the troops. Come on, guys. <laughs> I don't think we're going to even know now. That doesn't even help, does it? <laughs> oh, God. Right. I, what do you think? Is everybody on the side of the room that they want to be to on? Now? Are you sort of like hedging your bets? <laughs> no, I'm saying, are you, are, you, are you abstaining is what I'm saying. You're abstaining. Sit down if you're abstaining, would you? Because it's confusing us. Sit down, yes? If you're yeah. abstaining. No, no, let's have everybody stand. But close the doors. <laughs> Lock the doors. Don't let anybody in or out. I think we want. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know. It's so close. I, I still can't decide. It is so close. I, I think we need an independent uh, observer on this somehow. To... Okay, count off. Count off. One, two, three. Four. I can't tell. Where's Hannah, who's organising this? I, I think. Um, I, yeah. What? I think there are yeah. slightly more I on this side. I think you might side. have to call it a I draw. think there are slightly more on your no. side. I, th yeah. I think... I don't believe it. Yeah. If it's the motion is defeated. Motion carry it's or it's, it's or we could say it's a dead heat. I honestly, I think it's a draw, unless you count. <laughs> doesn't look more to me. <laughs> it was rigged. <laughs> I think we can say we should go for a drink. I wish it had been rigged. It would have been okay. easier, but it wasn't rigged. And we, you know, peace and love and connection. Peace, love, and connection, everybody. <laughs>